everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I am delighted to welcome you all today to LSE for this online event. My name is Claire Wenham. I'm an assistant professor of global health policy in the health policy department at LSE. Now, the impact of infectious diseases like COVID uh, on individuals and on communities doesn't fall evenly. We know that some people are more effective than others. And this can be dependent both uh, on, on, on their gender, on their uh, location, on their race, on their context, and on multiple other competing vulnerabilities. We also know it differs over context and it, it differs over time. So while studies are now showing that more men are dying of COVID, we also know that some of the secondary social and economic effects are negatively affecting women more than men. Indeed, school closures, lockdowns and reduced access to healthcare are just some of the ways the pandemic is exaggerating existing gender disparities across our societies globally. So there's an acute need for recognition of these gender dynamics of the outbreak, all the way from preparing for outbreaks, responding to outbreaks and thinking about how to revise and, and renew our response and our commitment to working together collectively at the global level to manage and mitigate against outbreaks. And this guidance is really important and it's why this event forms part of LSE's Shaping the Post-COVID World series, which is aiming to provide a platform the debate about the direction the world could and should be taking after this crisis and what policies we should be thinking about at the national and global level to try and be in a better position to respond to the crises we face at every level of our society. As chair of today's event, it gives me such a great pleasure to introduce our expert panel in the order they will speak, which is alphabetical. So first is Jeanette Ascona, who's a research and data specialist at UN Women and one of the principal authors of UN Women's 2018 flagship report, Turning Promises Into Action. She's been at UN Women for over a decade and before this, she used to work at UNDP, including importantly, working on the, U uh, the 2009 Human Development Report. Rupa Dat is the Executive Director of Women Global and Health. She's a passionate advocate for gender equality in global health and a leading voice in the movement to correct gender imbalance in global health leadership. Somehow she also finds time to be a practicing internal medicine physician. I don't quite know how. Professor Sarah Hawkes is a professor of global, health, global public health at University College London, where she is also the director of the UCL Center for Gender and Global Health and co-director and co-founder of the influential Global Health 5050 report, which advances action and accountability for gender equality in global health institutions across the world. And last but no means least, Megan O'Donnell is the Assistant Director for Gender and a Senior, for gender and a senior policy, policy Analyst at the Centre for Global Development, where she works on issues related to women's economic empowerment and financial inclusion. For those on Twitter, uh, you can follow and join in on today's event using the hashtag LSE COVID. This is an online event, it's being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast uh, afterwards, subject to no technical, uh, technical difficulties. And as usual, we really, really want to engage with all of you listening online, whether on Facebook Live or as part of this Zoom call. And so there'll be a chance for you to submit your questions uh, to all the panelists after our presentations. Each panelist is going to speak for about seven to nine minutes and then we'll open up the floor for more of a conversation. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Questions can be submitted to me and I will try and get through as many of them as we can before 6.30 uh, GMT. Uh, please let us know your name and affiliation, affiliation when you pose the questions and we're particularly keen to hear from any students, alumni and incoming students here at LSE. And so now I am delighted to hand over to Jeanette, who will begin our conversation this evening. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah. Perfect, great. Well, good afternoon, uh, good morning for some of you, good evening to those joining um, online from other parts of the world. Uh, thank you, um, LSE, for inviting me to join you today uh, to discuss uh, the urgent need to support women uh, during this crisis and uh, reestablish uh, the path to a more equal society for women and men. Um, I will focus my presentation uh, today um, on providing um, a summary overview 
of work we've been doing uh, around understanding the gender impacts of COVID-19, uh, work uh, being done by you and women, including on the direct uh, and secondary uh, health impacts of the crisis, uh, the economic impact, both in terms of job losses, but also in terms of increased um, uh, poverty. Uh, and there I'm talking about um, uh, extreme um, poverty and, um, and how the crisis has intensified unpaid care uh, work, um, as well as finally um, some emerging data uh, and, and what it's telling us about uh, the surge in domestic violence around the world. Um, across all of these areas, uh, we see differential impacts for women and girls as compared to, to men and boys. And a large reason for this has to do with the entrenched inequalities that existed uh, before the pandemic. This is not new, but of course, we're seeing um, many of these, you know, um, existing, uh, pre-existing inequalities being exploited and, and um, exacerbated um, as a result of the, of the crisis. Uh, the presentation draws on, on some of our latest reports, including work that we've done with Claire, in fact. Um, and um, I have links to um, these resources posted on my final slide, but I also wanted to take a, a few seconds to say that you can also download uh, these various publications, um, go to our website for, for the data. We have a, a data hub um, that looks at um, key indicators uh, that are relevant for assessing the situation of COVID-19 from a just agenda perspective. And you can go to data.unwomen.org to, to access all of those various reports, briefs, and resources. Um, this first slide, um, this is kind of the meat of the presentation. Um, the first slide is, is on the immediate um, health effects of the crisis. Um, it's, a, it's a summary, actually, of what we know, but also what we don't know in terms of the health impacts. Uh, when we published our, our latest report back in August, some 25 million cases were confor confirmed globally. Uh, that was back in August. A few months later, the, the figure is over 58 million. Um, so, so just in a few months, uh, more than double. Over 1.3 million have died. Uh, men account for a slight majority of confirmed cases, about 53%. However, women account for more than 63% of cases among those 85 and over. Um, but the data is still quite incomplete uh, and many questions remain unanswered, including on the vulnerability experienced by poor and marginalized groups, which we know um, are being most affected by this crisis. Uh, findings, as you can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, but findings from um, the UK show Black women experience um, are 4.3 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than white women, for example. That's one of the few countries where we have that data. At the global level, this sort of analysis is unavailable, uh, this sort of intersectional approach to understanding um, uh, the, the, the health impact. In fact, globally, as of 1st of November, um, just 28% of confirmed COVID-19 cases, uh, information on, on cases reported by uh, two WHO from, by governments was disaggregated by sex. And there it's a very narrow definition, right? Meaning differences between males and females. Uh, information by race, ethnicity, by migration status, by gender identity, which by the way is different than, than when you disaggregate by, by sex. Uh, by disability and other characteristics are simply not available, at least not in the global level. And I'll just point very briefly to um, what was the, the number of cases and the percent of cases that we had data by sex and age um, in July, that was 37%. And as I just said, that number has now gone down to 28%, at least in terms of the reporting that's being done by governments directly to WHO. Um, uh, we know from, from past crises um, that another really big impact um, of these types of health crises is the impact that it has on women's access to, to sexual and reproductive health uh, and health services. Uh, so that's a big area of concern um, across countries. Uh, women in need of family planning services are reporting difficulty accessing them since the pandemic began. Uh, we have data from, from rapid gender assessments conducted by UN Women in Azerbaijan and Turkey, for example, where 60% of women uh, report having trouble accessing uh, gynecological um, care as a result of COVID-19, as an example. 
Um, we know from past crises that reduced access to sexual and reproductive health services can lead to major reversals uh, in the progress made in reducing MMR. Um, and so here you have just an example. This is um, in, in the slide, an example of progress we've made since the year 2000 on reducing MMR globally and across region, really seeing a trend downward um, in, this, in this very important target um, and indicator. Uh, but according to, to just some of the preliminary data being reported to WHO at the country level, uh, we have reasons to believe that, that the, the pandemic may actually reverse some of this progress. And, and by, uh, according to some estimates, um, you know, MMR might increase by, by over 100,000 women in, in 12 months if, if urgent action isn't taken. Uh, data from Zimbabwe, for example, shows that the number of C-sections um, performed uh, decreased by 42% between January and April of 2020 compared with the same period in 2019. Uh, the number of live births in health facilities um, also fell by 21% and new clients of, of birth control pills dropped by 90%. So just an illustrative example of the, the impact that we're seeing um, at the country level. But COVID-19 um, is not only a health crisis as we all know, it is also an economic and social crisis. Some of the sectors hard, hardest hit uh, by the pandemic are feminized sectors characterized by low pay and poor working conditions, including lack of basic worker protect, protection, uh, such as paid sick and family leave. Uh, the retail industry, accommodation and food sectors, for example, which require face-to-face -face interactions have been devastated by, by job losses. In most countries, women are overrepresented um, in these sectors, often with a tenuous um, hold on their jobs to begin with. Globally, it's estimated that women are 19% more at risk of job loss than men as a result of the crisis. Uh, female essential workers on the front lines are also facing challenges, including elevated exposure to the virus. And I won't go into all of the details here, but I do encourage you to, to go to our report to, to learn more. I did want to highlight some of this new data that actually is coming out in a blog with ILO um, later this week. Um, this uh, data uh, tells us something that I think we knew from before the pandemic, right? That women's participation in labor markets are shaped by their domestic and care, uh, caregiving responsibilities in ways that men's are not. Uh, when we look at labor force participation rates by sex, uh, we see very little difference if we're looking at lone person households, right? Women living alone compared to men living alone. Uh, the gaps in, in participation and access to, a, to an income of your own and to jobs uh, really becomes wider when we compare women in, in coupled households, for example, with small children as, at home compared to, to men in that same uh, household composition. And there is also you know, growing evidence um, in, in this time of, of, of the pandemic that um, huge care burdens that have uh, really ballooned as a result of the crisis are, are actually leading to women abandoning the labor market altogether. According to uh, emerging data from a sample of, of 55 high and middle income countries, 48% of women aged 25 and over were out of the labor force um, by, by June of 2020 compared to 30% of men. And that's an additional 28 million women not looking for work, not employed and, and, and outside of the labor force completely. Um, we have some data from some countries and some regions, it's quite limited, uh, but the data that we do have is actually pointing to some of the potential reasons for this. And again, it has to do with, with this care burden. Data from the United States, the European Union and the United Kingdom point to increases in unpaid care and domestic work and that broader uh, child care crisis as a leading factor in women being forced out of the labor force. Um, in this a slide that I'm showing uh, to those of you uh, that are connected today, um, you can see how um, um, women are more likely than men uh, to be absent uh, from work during the peak hours of the, of the first wave of the pandemic. Uh, the red line is, is the women and then the, the, the green line is, is the, the figure for men. 
And this is really, you know, when schools and childcare centers were closed and, and remote and online formats of learning were put in place. And, and as you can see, it's women that are oftentimes taking the bulk of this responsibility and, and, have, and that having really, you know, um, significant impacts on their access to, to other uh, paid work and, and also more broadly to, to their health and well being. Um, in turn, a, a slowing economy, job losses, um, and lack of social protection is causing a resurgence in extreme poverty, affecting women the most. Already women um, are more likely uh, before, uh, than men to live in extreme poverty. This is before the pandemic, we, we knew this to be true. As the crisis um, exacerbates labor market instabilities, many more women are expected to fall into extreme poverty. Um, and uh, according to the projections uh, commissioned by, by UN Women and UNDP, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, will uh, see a surge in, in extreme poverty in, in developing countries. By 2021, uh, around 435 million women and girls will be living on less than $1.90 a day, including 47 million pushed, pushed into poverty as a result of the crisis. Um, we actually are going to be updating these figures. We're working with um, the University of Denver that, that uh, did this, uh, these, these forecasts for us to take into account some of that new data that I was highlighting earlier on job losses and so on. And so the, the true picture might be even more devastating than what this figure is alluding to here. And again, just very quickly, the red line is the female poverty line um, adjusting for the COVID impact and, and the male line. And of course, you know, the, the dotted lines were what we were expecting to see before the crisis, right? So a huge jump as a result of COVID-19. Um, food insecurity and hunger is also expected to spike um, as a result of the crisis. The number of people uh, facing acute food insecurity in low and middle income countries is projected to nearly double to 265 million by the end of 2020. Uh, the chances of being severely food insecure were already high for women, 20%, uh, 27% higher for women than men at the global level. And so the, the figures that I have here are pre-pandemic, but we are expecting um, some, some potential real increases in not only the number, but also the gap in in food insecurity uh, across regions. And so something that I wanted to highlight, but again, um, you know, as more data becomes available, we'll be able to see the true impact of the crisis on, on this very important area. And with the few minutes that I have left, I, I, ha um, I wanted to turn back to, to this care crisis. Um, unpaid care has, has intensified uh, for both women and men. Um, in these uncertain times, uh, parents, I think we're hearing the world over, are, are desperately trying to achieve a workable balance. Um, you know, uh, but even in normal times, the balance between work and family life has not been an easy one to achieve. The challenge is not new, uh, especially not for women, uh, but the pandemic is shining a stadium size light to the problem. Um, and as you can see from, from the figures that I have in front of you, this infographic just highlighting some of the data that's coming out of uh, Europe and Central Asia, for example, we have a number of other rapid gender assessments um, currently being fielded that um, I think will also yield even more light into this, this growing issue, uh, and an issue again that predates the crisis and is only intensified. Violence against women also continues um, unabated. Already globally, uh, close to 250 million women and girls aged 15 to 49 had been subject to sexual and or physical violence by an intimate partner in the past, in the last year. That's data uh, collected before the pandemic. Data coming out of this period of crisis um, remains scarce. Uh, we do have some evidence of increases in, in calls uh, to, to help centers and, and things of that nature. Uh, but we know that, um, you know, irrespective of having necessarily the intimate partner violence data that we collect from survey data, we do know that um, some of those risk factors are being um, affected by, by this crisis. And here we're talking about, um, you know, um, the, the pressure that households face uh, in terms of increased strain, um, in terms of income security, health and, and other money worries, uh, living in cramped and confined living conditions, 
um, and and uh, women being you know uh, forced and, and having to be kind of um, quarantined with with um, the perpetrators of violence, um, very likely intensifying uh, uh, the domestic violence that they're experiencing. Um, the other area that I wanted to highlight here is more on, on kind of the, the response and, and, and the actions that, that UN Women is calling for in this area. We know that many countries have very recently um, uh, introduced laws against domestic violence, uh, which is great news, uh, but implementation and enforcement remains weak and access to justice in many contexts remains elusive. Uh, so in the context of COVID-19, support for women and girls experiencing violence is more urgent than ever. Um, measures to protect um, women from violence must be uh, a standard part of government response to the pandemic, as well as, as, well as part of the long-term recovery packages that, that many countries are, are instituting. Key priority areas very quickly are, for example, ensuring that services for survivors are regarded as essential. They must be regarded as part of that essential package of services and, and, and policies to, to address um, the, the impact of the crisis, uh, that these services remain open um, and are adequately resourced. Um, we need to also place a high priority on police and justice responses to this area, to this issue. And uh, you know, of course, greater support for hotlines for women's rights organizations working on the front line as just some other uh, concrete examples in this area. And then finally, um, you know, um, urgent action is just needed across all of these areas, right? And so we won't go into a lot of detail here with only 10 minutes, but very quickly, uh, we need to be protecting women's health and well-being, including ensuring access to sexual and reproductive health services. So this is an area that in our advice uh, to governments, we're, we're really emphasizing. Uh, we need to recognize, reduce, and redistribute um, unpaid care and domestic work and really institute policies that, that can make a difference here. And this is something, again, that you know uh, many of us have been calling for for many years now. Um, and it's something that I think is, is more urgent than ever, ever before. Um, there is a strong need and an important need to address the, the pandemic's economic impact, which are definitely um, you know, um, uh, gendered. Um, we need to be focusing on eliminating longstanding inequalities that, that hinder women's um, opportunity in the labor market. Again, these are not new things. These are just areas that you know, have, have um, gained more you know, um, uh, prominence uh, given the pandemic, but really areas that have been long, long, um, longstanding issues. Um, I talked about violence against women. And then finally, I'll just maybe end here and say that the other area that I think um, is really quite essential um, is focusing and um, allocating uh, resources to improve gender data collection um, and disaggregating the data that we have across multiple dimensions, not just sex and age, but across many other dimensions that we know matter for understanding and for bringing visibility to those that are most marginalized and excluded in society. And so uh, an emphasis there on data and, and using data and evidence uh, and that knowledge to inform policy um, at, the, at the country level. I'll stop there. Um, just very quickly, many of the um, sort resources that I highlighted are available and there's a link here to, to some of those and, and happy to share them on, on the webpage that LSE will be creating for, for this event. So, so with that, thank you. Over to you, Claire. Thank you so much, uh, much Jeanette. We really, really appreciate you coming to talk to us. So next I'm gonna pass over to Rupa. Great, thanks, Claire. Me one second too. Good evening, good morning uh, to everyone. I'm really excited to join in on this conversation about COVID-19 and gender um, and to follow after my colleague Jeanette from um, UN Women. I really am going to really focus on particularly the experience of women in the health and social workforce. So women in global health, we are a global movement, a platform for all voices, a catalytic force, a strategic disruptor. We have over 24 chapters around the world and we invite all of you that are keen to advance gender equality in global health leadership by challenging power and privilege uh, to please join us. A uh, little bit about global health as a field. Uh, global health is delivered by women, but led by men. If you take a look at this 
pyramid of uh, leadership in global health, what you'll notice is that women provide uh, most of the care and particularly in the long-term care, those numbers are more than 90% occupied by women. When you take a look at the health and social workforce, um, those numbers are around 70%. But quickly, as you start looking at leadership roles where decision-making is happening, those numbers dwindle down to the 25 to 30% range. And particularly in decision-making in the private sector, we know that women's representation is the most limited at less than 5%. And it's critical to recognize where power is distributed in global health because that will um, and does influence the realities that women are facing in COVID-19. We've heard many uh, talk about the fact that COVID-19 um, is not uh, leading to new realities, but actually magnifying existing um, inequalities that exist. So global health security depends on women. Uh, the pyramid that I just shared shows how much of the health and social sector, but also the social protections that we depend on are really um, you know, held up by women particularly. So when we take a look at um, what are the what is the impact of COVID-19 for women and especially women health workers? Um, as my colleague had already alluded to, I'm going to dive into this a little bit more deeply. Um, we know that there is a sense of pride and professional satisfaction that's really critical um, right now in the health sector. Many health workers do feel a lot of pride and professional satisfaction who are women for playing a critical role in health, um, society and global health security, but this is not at a cost. And some of those things that are really um, the challenges that women in the health workforce are facing, number one has been around risk of infecting themselves, their family, and especially vulnerable relatives. Early on, there was not appropriate physical protective equipment universally around the world, um, but we know that even today, many health workers and especially community health workers that are at the front line, the most exposed, they are at risk of getting the infection and they do have to make difficult decisions about whether or not, um, you know, to self isolate to ensure that they don't bring the infection of COVID-19 back to their households, back to their communities. And these are not easy decisions. For many women, it is also about um, whether or not to spend time um, away from younger children uh, to to not expose them or elderly parents to not expose them to the virus. Um, we also know that there is a, um, you know, as part of this high risk of infection, there's also long term health impacts. Um, we know that the estimates, um, again, UN Women's website is a great resource to see which countries are reporting um, health worker infections um, by gender. We know that we have an issue with not enough sex and gender disaggregated data. We also know that particularly we don't have enough uh, um, disaggregated data by health worker infections. But in the United States, for example, the numbers are upwards of 75% um, uh, of the health worker infections in the United States are women. These are consistent in other countries that have also reported data where women are experiencing majority of the infections in the health workforce. Um, we know this is also heightened if you look at it in, with things from an intersectionality lens, Particularly, um, uh, we know that uh, in the United States, in the UK, where we do have number, um, Black people, Indigenous people, people of color um, are often uh, required to serve as, uh, as essential workers, and they're more likely to face infections and, um, and also have more complications as well. Um, we know that physical protective equipment has not been adequate. Um, in the beginning, we heard uh, stories uh, from Wuhan, China, of how women did not have appropriate dignity um, uh, when it came to menstruating and not having body suits made in a way that could easily accommodate for the physical uh, aspects of the female body. We also know that many of the body um, uh, hazard suits were much larger in size, requiring many places for women to duct tape to fit them um, into their appropriate body shape. And uh, again, this is an example of how health systems have been uh, created in a gender blind manner. We also know that safety at work uh, is not just related to the physical protective equipment, but the aspects of violence are really increasing. And as frustrations are growing, um, we've heard, heard from our colleague from UN Women talking about the increased um, poverty, um, increased uh, food insecurity, um, and the increased gender-based violence and um, just uh, domestic violence that's in happening. So all of that really, um, you know, some of those frustrations are also spilling in and we're seeing the effects of it in the health workforce. We've heard um, increased attacks of frontline health workers, 
uh, from stones being thrown in India and Pakistan at health workers to bleach being poured at health workers in Philippines. I mean, these are just very horrific uh, human rights violations. And again, these are the people that are responsible for protecting societies, protecting people, but they're also facing a brunt of the violence. Um, and we know that uh, health workers or women health workers are not immune to the gender-based violence at home as well. Um, and this is all happening uh, you know, in the context of being uh, powerless. Um, health workers are not represented in decision-making bodies. Uh, particularly, we know this has um, been an issue before COVID-19. This year marks the year of the nurse and midwife. And one of the call to actions uh, for this year has been around ensuring that nurses and midwives are part of decision-making bodies at the national level. What COVID-19 has shown us, and I'll be covering this data in a bit more on the, from a gender aspect, is again, health workers are not being represented in the COVID-19 advisory and national advisory boards that have been created. So they do feel powerless um, and they're being marginalized in decision-making, yet they hold the expertise of the pandemic. Um, we also know there's increasing stigma um, in the community for health workers being a exposed to COVID-19. Um, we are hearing about increased mental stress. We are talking about a lot more mental health needs society-wide, but particularly unique to the health workforce is um, the increased uh, burden of um, really having both PTSD from exposure to COVID-19 and making those difficult decisions of whether or not you're exposing your family and relatives um, and friends and communities to COVID-19. So we know that there has been um, reports of increased um, suicide and suicide attempts amongst um, health workers and especially female health workers. Um, we know there is long hours, exhaustion. Um, this was especially seen in the first aspects of, uh, of the pandemic, but it continues to spill over as we see waves number two and waves number three. Um, and this is in the context of the increased domestic work as the UN Women colleague talked about. We know women on average have two to three hours of uh, household um, care responsibilities, COVID-19, those numbers have easily um, doubled and tripled in many contexts, and those remain unpaid um, care responsibilities in the home and in the community. Um, we know managing childcare and homeschooling is also um, been uh, on the hands of women, and women health workers are not immune to that. Uh, policies are not designed to factor in that women are majority of the health workers in the, in the health system and need additional um, work um, policies policies that support not just uh, family-friendly work policies, but acknowledge the needs of, of women, uh, particularly having to be responsible for childcare and having much more longer hours, especially during a pandemic. So they do not have always access to nursery, schools, extended family care and support. Um, and we've heard about the financial hardship, but one of the other things about the health sector, it is one of the most unequal sectors. Um, the gender uh, pay gap where we can measure it shows us that the wage uh, the gender pay gap is around 29%, whereas we know globally in other sectors, it's around 20%. Um, another number to walk away with is that half of what women do in the health sector remains um, unpaid, which amounts to 1.5 trillion US dollars annually of GDP, which is a very large number. Um, and we know that it, during COVID-19, we're gonna depend even more on the poorest women to subsidize healthcare for all of us. It's already happening around the world and uh, the pandemic is just uh, widening these inequalities and putting more burden um, on women. And we know that more and more women are going to be pushed out from the formal sector into the informal sector pushed out from full-time roles to part-time and even, you know, um, even more than that, again, they'll be pushed out of the workforce altogether. And these are things that the health sector particularly needs to take a look at, uh, given that the health sector has been one of the means for women's economic empowerment. And we do have an 18 million health worker shortage predicted by 2030. So when we talk about uh, health security depends on women, these are the many different ways it's happening. Um, um, and just um, in closing, wanted to highlight, we know that um, COVID-19, it is an emergency, but do men really know best? 
question mark. We know that uh, you know this pandemic has really showed the power of women, the expertise of women. Um, we know that deaths from COVID-19 uh, countries are about six times lower. Um, again, uh, this is early data, but there it does show clues about the fact that women do have expertise and and are approaching um, the res the pandemic response differently, often more collaborative, less divisive, more based on science, um, and and that does have an impact on public trust and overall response. Um, uh, but yet only 12 out of 193 countries are led by women. So we, we have a lot of work to do with women's political leadership. And in our most recent review that Women in Global Health did, looking at over 114 task forces around the world of 87 countries, 85% of those task teams continue to be majority um, uh, men and less than 5% have gender parity. And so we know that leadership is quite skewed. Uh, Women in Global Health has launched a call to action, which you can learn more about at covid5050.org, where we focus um, is really around uh, ask one, making sure that women are part of decision making at all levels, ask two around safe and decent work conditions, ask three about recognizing the value of women's unpaid care work, ask for really about adopting a gender responsive approach to health security, which includes um, data collection and anal analysis, and ask five, which is really funding women's movements, um, which are the least funded in the gender equality pot of money um, to really be able to do their important work and funding women's movements in low middle income countries really at the community level. We know that leads to a triple gender dividend, a health dividend, a gender equality dividend, and a development dividend. Um, and in, in closing, you know, we, we have a couple of key messages that I really want to leave, uh, leave with all of you, and these will be, these slides will be available, but really, you know, what we need to acknowledge is that COVID-19 is a global wake-up call to build back better, or as some are saying, build back differently, build back new, whichever the message is, it is an opportunity for us to really look at the inequalities that we know that have existed that are now being magnified and really tap into the 100% talent pool of women, uh, improve the health worker conditions, and um, really the women who deliver our health and social care deserve a new social contract with decent working conditions and equal role in decision making. And if we take uh, if we take care of our health and social workers, they will keep us safe and they will also help us in creating um, stronger, more resilient health systems and societies. Uh, we have a new report out that you can uh, look into for the data that we've gathered thus far in COVID-19 and as it relates to overall the realities of women in the health and social workforce. Um, and then finally, we have a few more resources available and please do stay in touch with Women in Global Health. We are releasing uh, perspectives perspectives and data with our colleagues and partners all around the world um, during this pandemic to really ensure that we create this new social contract. Uh, so join the Women in Global Health movement and I turn it back to you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rupa. Um, we just have one point of clarification that's come in. Perhaps you could elaborate on the unpaid work women do in the healthcare sector. Great. So, um, so this is a, there's the unpaid work is uh, in two different categories when we take a look at it. So one number, which is um, really the big number we're looking at is the work that women do in what we call uh, the informal aspect of the health sector, which comes in um, often the community health workers um, are not considered um, part of the formal labor market. They're seen as volunteers. So they often are given stipends. Um, and sometimes it's not even stipends, it's incentives such as you get access to medication, you get access to uh, mobile technology, and that is the means of compensation. Um, what that results in that is that if, um, as we are operating right now, such as a pandemic, if there is um, all of a sudden a, a, a halt in jobs, they do not uh, get the protections that other health workers do as being part of formally part of the labor market, nor are they getting, um, uh, you know, continuous salary. And so that's really, um, you know, the informal aspect of, of the health um, sector where community health workers are. Now, there's another part of um, the unpaid work, which we talk about is the role that women and, and majority women already provide in their household and, household and communities, which is uh, providing childcare, care for elderly people. And what the pandemic has shown us is that they're even doing much more primary healthcare at 
home and they're being asked to do much more primary health care um, management and all of that remains um, again in the uncompensated uh, way and it's not even being counted um, so th that's that's the definition and the estimates of even that 1.5 trillion us dollars if you want to learn more about it it is from a lancet commission that was released in 2015 called women and health um, and we know um, that when we've talked to the health economists that have been uh, did that work is that this is likely to be even underestimated and the pandemic those numbers are just uh, going up higher thanks Rupa, for clarifying that um so now i'm delighted to pass over to sarah thank you very much claire i am just uh hoping that this is now visible to you all um sorry i'm just gonna there we go. Um, right. <laughs> um, so it's it, it, it's great to have heard the the previous two talks, which gave a, a, a fantastic overview of um, the the particularly the gender impact of of COVID across multiple sectors, and then um, obviously Rupa's very clear um, view of the the impact that that gender um, is having on on COVID as it impacts the health sector in general. But what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes is something a lot narrower, um, which is the impact of sex and gender on COVID outcomes as it relates to cases of COVID, death from COVID. In other words, who's actually getting infected? Um, who's at risk of hospitalization? Who's at risk of death? And what's that got to do with sex and gender? So um, I, I think as, as, as has already been alluded to um, by both previous speakers, there is actually an absence of, of um, sex disaggregated data in many sectors. And when, when COVID kind of first came into public consciousness back in February, March, as Global Health 5050, we're very concerned with the strength of empirical evidence and what that means for policy responses um, in, in the health sector. And we were looking for sex disaggregated data on COVID and really not finding it. Um, we were looking on uh, 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 data from national governments, in other words, what ministries of health were putting out. And so um, somewhat foolishly and to our, <laughs> certainly to the detriment of our, uh, of our own data as far as unpaid labor is concerned and lack of sleep over the past uh, 10 months is concerned, we stepped into the breach of, of the, 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 the gender data gap and decided that what we would try to do is actually compile sex disaggregated data um, that was being put out by, by governments in the recognition that although WHO as the coordinating body for the global health system should have the mandate to, to compile sex disaggregated data, it doesn't actually have the mandate to force countries to report sex disaggregated data. It can make recommendations, but it's up to countries whether or not they actually report data in a way that allows people like us to then come along and say, well, look at the differences um, between men and women or look at the differences by age categories. And I'll come back in a little while to look at the differences by any other kind of intersectional lens that any of us might be interested in as far as the pandemic is concerned. So, I mean, it's been a fascinating experience setting up a data tracker like this, partly for the realization that despite everything that we're all taught in wonderful schools of public health, such as in LSE or UCL or all of those amazing schools of public health that we could all name around the world, which teach you that, you know, data is distributed in a certain way within ministries and through health information systems, et cetera, et cetera. The reality of the pandemic is that actually we've been finding data on Twitter or on YouTube accounts. 
or um, just put out in very hard to find PDFs buried somewhere on a ministerial website. Right now, we are tracking data from, I just worked this out, um, 184 countries. And we track, we track data from each Ministry of Health or from each country um, every two weeks. And so the next few slides are really just to, to present to you what we have found currently. Um, you know, what, what we found in terms of trends, etc., is, is a slightly different talk, but I'll, I'll just tell you what, what it is that we're finding currently. What we find is that it's actually only a minority of countries that present um, meaningful sex disaggregated data, particularly on more than one data point. So if you want to know something about cases and death, in a sex disaggregated fashion, it's very difficult to find a substantial number of countries that um, report data in that way. The second thing that, that we have found, which I know Jeanette um, has, has flagged up already, is that actually the numbers of countries that are reporting sex disaggregated data is going down. It's not consistent. A country might have reported sex disaggregated data back in uh, July, for example, and is no longer doing so. The second thing that we've discovered is that it's really difficult to get a full picture of what is happening in terms of COVID. If we think about something beyond cases and deaths. And I think, you know, even for those, those of, for the majority of the audience that are not trained epidemiologists, although I suspect that by this stage of the pandemic, actually we all feel like we're trained epidemiologists and all of us can tell each other what an R value is. But for, for those of us without formal training in, in epidemiology, I think you'll have all realized by now that actually cases in particular are very, susceptible to the fluctuations of political priorities. So if a government put lo puts lots of money and lots of resources into rolling out a testing program, your case numbers will go up. The thing that kind of at the end of the day really tells you something about sex disaggregated differences in terms of access to services is knowing something about who's actually getting tested. And for that, we've got very low numbers of countries. We've only got 10 countries that tell us anything about sex disaggregated testing data, for example. And then as Rupa has alluded to, there are a small number of countries that do tell us about sex disaggregated cases in health workers. And essentially those cases, as far as I, I can see, reflect the sex disaggregated distribution of the labor force in, in the health sector in those countries. So for countries where you've got a very high majority of, of, of health workers who are female, you have more cases in female health workers. For a couple of countries where you actually have more male health workers, you have more male cases in the health workforce. But then we see, you know, kind of what, what happens to people who, who get tested, who get confirmed as a case, in terms of who gets hospitalized, who, who gets admitted to ICU because they have a, a, a severe case, and then finally, um, who dies. And the numbers, as, as I've said, are just not consistent enough for us to be able to give you a, a, a global picture um, across every single country with a full data set. But, but we've got enough data coming in from enough countries to be able to, to tell you the patterns that we see. And I think one of the things that's it's really it, you know, important to look at a, pic, a, a, a graph like this and kind of think about what does it mean is what would we expect to see? All things being equal, what would we expect to see? Would we actually expect to see, for example, equal numbers of men and women being hospitalized, all, thing, all other things being equal, would we actually expect to see equal
equal numbers of men and women dying, all other things being equal. And I, I think, to be really honest with you, we don't actually have enough surety in our data to know whether what kind of what level of difference we expect to see between men and women. What we can say is that right now there are actually fewer men who go and get tested compared to women. It's a small number of countries, but that fits a very well established pattern of healthcare seeking, even for um, screening programs, whereby men are much less likely to take part in screening programs than women are. So systematic review done a couple of years ago by Alan White and colleagues very clearly showed that everything we know about who goes and seeks healthcare is replicated in terms of who goes and gets tested. And we're seeing that in COVID as, as well. Men in the eight countries where we have the data are less likely to get, to get tested. And then what we see, as has already been mentioned, is that men are more likely to be confirmed as a case, more likely to be hospitalized, more likely to be admitted to ICU, and at the end of the day are more likely to die compared to women. So the question is why? Let me skip that slide and ask why. <laughs> And this is where this is why I see say you know would we actually expect that those numbers those bars to 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 hover equally equally around the one line i.e. where men and women have equal outcomes, and I think the answer to that is probably no because we know that for any disease almost any disease that you can think of or any condition that you can think of there is a contribution of biology as well as gender. And we know that for the infectious diseases in particular, there is quite a well-established contribution of biology that acts differently in men and women in terms of men and women as defined by X and Y and XX chromosomal makeup, that that determines your immunological profile, your hormonal profile, and your ability to respond to the onslaught of an infectious disease. So we know that people with XX chromosomes have much more reactive immune systems in response to certain triggers from the environment, including pathogenic triggers, that leads, for example, to people with XX chromosomes being at higher risk of autoimmune disorders, but also being better, quote unquote, at fighting off infection. So we know that, that there are biological differences between, uh, depending on chromosomal makeup, that are likely to mean that we're not going to see exactly equal outcomes between men and women in something like a global pandemic. Is that the only reason we're seeing these differences? I think that, again, the answer to that is probably no. That in addition to the role that sex differences are likely to be playing, I'm convinced, I'm pretty sure that everybody else on the panel is also convinced, but given the political nature of the gendered world in which we live, there are still some people unconvinced, but I'm convinced that gender is also playing a difference in why we see these outcome differences between men and women. And I mean, here's, here's one slide taken from the Global Health 5050 website. You can play around with the website, and make your own slides, um, but I, I, I promise you they're all going to show the same picture. I'm not manipulating the data. I'm just, just showing you what, what the picture shows, which is that there is a clear and statistically significant relationship between the gender equality of a country and the risk of death between men and women from COVID in that country. And the relationship is such that the more gender unequal a country is by the UNDP um, Gender Inequality Index, 
the higher the difference in the risk of death between men and women. In other words, the higher the death rate in men compared to women in more gender unequal countries. And the thing about that statistic is it's quite difficult to kind of get your mind around quite frequently because it, it's, it's frequently seen as being very counterintuitive to how we think about gender equality and outcomes in life. But the reality of that statistic is that it's not the own, COVID is not the only condition in which we see this kind of relationship. And here's what I think is, is one explanation of the relationship between gender and COVID outcomes like the one I've just shown you, which is that in those gender unequal societies where men have more power, they have more power essentially to participate in, um, in environments that are injurious to their health. In particular, they have more power to participate in exposure to risk environments such as tobacco smoking, and exposure to high particulate um, air pollution that leads to higher rates of non-communicable diseases that from the very beginning we have known are associated with higher rates of death um, from COVID. So I think that there is a gendered pathway of risk that is, um, working against men's positive outcomes in COVID in very gender unequal societies, but in more gender equal societies puts women at as higher risk as men. So in those countries where we're seeing COVID outcomes, the COVID death rates that are equal in men and women, we're also seeing women with, for example, a much higher participation in the paid labor workforce, women with a much higher rate of exposure through, um, through activities such as tobacco smoking and alcohol drinking. I'm just flagging up this one slide to kind of support my hypothesis, but also to remind us all that COVID is not an exception in this kind of gendered way of thinking about why we see these differences between men and women in terms of health and well-being outcomes. In every country in the world, men will not live as long as women. And WHO in its 2019 health, World Health Statistics report outlined for us what are the major contributors to the big differences in life expectancy between men and women. And what we see is that it's the, it's the non-communicable diseases that are also associated with the higher risk of death in COVID that are the biggest contributors to the life expectancy differences between men and women. Heart disease, lung disease, strokes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, etc. These are the, the, the diseases causing men to not have as high a life expectancy as women and also associated with higher risks of death um, from COVID. So COVID is fitting a pattern. It's not an exception, it's fitting, fitting a pattern as far as um, risk of mortality being higher in men is concerned. I think there are other reasons we might be seeing those differences. For example, I think it's, it's absolutely worth investigating why we're, we're seeing such huge differences in gender unequal countries and what that means for the chances that, for example, women's deaths are not being captured by death registration systems. I think that, that and we, we don't know, I haven't, I mean, it would be great if somebody in the audience has an answer to that, but I think there's a whole range of reasons what that uh, allude that uh, in relation to gender rather than biological sex that explain why we see these differences in the data sets that we capture. And, I'm not going to go through this full slide, despite your plea, as far as the podcast is concerned, Claire, but I will just mention one thing in terms of what this means 
sort of building forward as, as we think about the post-COVID world that, that we are hopefully all going to be moving into um, in the next 12 months or so. First of all, I think that the you know, the, the data that we've been collecting over the 10 months, past 10 months, really illustrate to us that now is not the time to stop collecting sex segregated data. And that when interventions such as a vaccine are being rolled out across the world, we absolutely need sex segregated data on vaccines in order to understand the relationship between equality and access to interventions, um, which can otherwise work in the disfavor of women. But I think the, the other thing that I'd really like to flag up, particularly amongst for, for the people at the start of their careers, the people who are you know, coming to great institutions such as LSE to learn how to interpret data, is that the one thing that, that I think we've all learned over the past year running this data tracker is that data is not just a technical exercise, that what this data has allowed us to do is hold systems to account. It, that it's not just about understanding the risk and, and spread of an epidemic, it's about holding government systems to account to ensure that we achieve equity and equality for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's fascinating. Lots of questions, I'm sure. Um, and finally, I'm uh, going to pass over to Megan. Thank you so much, Claire. And thank you to my fellow panelists, um, Jeanette, for your uh, really comprehensive overview of the various gendered dimensions of the pandemic and resulting recession, and Rupa and Sarah for your deeper dives into how all of this is playing out for the health workforce and in terms of who is being uh, impacted directly in terms of health outcomes. What I will plan to do for the next few minutes is hope to add a complementary angle to the discussion um, by going a bit deeper into some of the other indirect impacts that Jeanette, you briefly alluded to in your presentation, uh, consistent with what we do at the Center for Global Development be talking a bit more about the gendered nature of poverty, economic opportunity, and also violence, as that's been a big priority area for us uh, since the start of the pandemic. And specifically, um, what I'll hope to do is to explore in a bit more detail what donors and policymakers are doing to respond to some of these, these impacts and these problems that other panelists have uh, painted such a, a thorough picture of and importantly, what else needs to be done? Uh, specifically thinking through sort of the dual lens of more and better, because I think many of us who've worked in the gender space for years know we always need more investment. There's always a need for more financing for these under-prioritized issues. Um, but of course, we also know that not all policies and not all interventions are created equal. So how can rigorous research and evidence guide decision making so that increasingly limited resources are used as effectively as possible uh, to narrow the gender gaps that we all have top of mind. Four main points uh, that I hope to convey to all of you. The first uh, builds on what Rupa alluded to earlier about the gender blind nature, um, not just of the health systems that she discussed, but I would say frankly, relief and response efforts to date across various sectors and, and dimensions of people's lives. Um, I'll speak first to social protection. I mean, we know that that, especially in the low and middle income country context that CGD focuses on, is just as, if not more so, top of mind um, than the immediate health impacts of the pandemic. I mean, in many South Asian, Sub-Saharan African, et cetera, country contexts, um, we've seen the real sort of fears and insecurities, as Jeanette alluded to, really come down to uh, lost income uh, due to lockdown measures and, and other quarantines being imposed, uh, therefore increased uh, poverty and, and food insecurity in households. And so fortunately, you know, on one hand, there have been hundreds and hundreds of social protection and assistance programs, mostly in the form of cash transfers mobilized 
uh, in the COVID context. So whether these are expansions of existing programs to cast a wider net, reach uh, the new poor or uh, additional beneficiaries, recipients who otherwise might not have required those, those payments and those forms of support previously, or whether it's sort of a deepening or an increase um, of benefits being given to pre-COVID recipients of these programs, they take different forms. They've been mobilized in innovative ways. Uh, it's been quite amazing to see in India, in Pakistan, in Togo, across country contexts that governments have moved quickly um, and they've used digital platforms, mobile phones as a form of technology, for example, to reach people uh, quickly and, and sort of conforming to social distance guidelines. Uh, but there are unintended consequences of these innovations from a gendered perspective. And to give a little bit more concrete of, of an example, myself and a colleague at CGD, Shelby Borgo, a few months back, we took a, a dive into the financial inclusion insights data um, for Pakistan. Because Pakistan is an example of a country that had a social assistance program already in place uh, that happened to be targeted to women within households. Then they shifted gears a bit to try to cast that wider net that I mentioned. Um, but unfortunately, due to pre-existing gender gaps within the country, uh, those that relate to ID ownership, uh, mobile phone ownership and, and use, and also ownership of bank accounts, what would have previously been a social assistance program pre-COVID that was exclusively directed towards women, Shelby and I estimate has the risk of getting 75% of recipients, new recipients under COVID as men. So to really underscore the point that a program, uh, much as we need to prioritize efficiency, rolled out in a gender blind way, cannot be assumed to have gender neutral effects. And so how do we balance the need for efficiency and casting that wide net with some of these unintended consequences that may in the medium to long term actually exacerbate inequality within a given country context. Second point I wanna make, I think complements hopefully what Sarah had raised about the need for data, not just for its own sake, but really to be able to hold, I loved how you put it, systems, governments and donor institutions to account. Uh, within the realm of economic uh, recovery and, and longer term development, Top of mind right now for us is asking questions around where are those bailout funds and those stopgap financing uh, support systems being directed. We already knew pre-COVID that women as entrepreneurs faced additional barriers to accessing finance, not to mention markets and networks and information to help grow their businesses. And the fear or suspicion right now is that in that hurry to get a lot of stopgap financing mobilized, we are not sure if those additional barriers have now compounded in the COVID context. I know that Jeanette's uh, team and maybe colleagues at UN Women are working to mobilize some data. The World Enterprise Surveys have looked at impacts on entrepreneurs. We connect international and other, other sources of data that right now we're uh, scoping and looking to pull together to get a, a clearer kind of more global in scope picture of exactly those dynamics. But regardless, um, it stands to reason that going forward, donors that have leverage to be requesting information on where these types of loans are going should exercise that leverage so that we have a clearer sense of the baseline. We have a clearer sense of where that financing is being directed and therefore the more precise nature of the gaps that we have to fill. Um, I'd say the same with regard to social protection. Uh, there currently aren't a whole lot of systems out there that are publishing information on the gender of the recipients of those payments. More publicly available sort of transparent data on that front would go a long way, again, to understanding those gaps and what needs to be addressed going forward, potentially corrected. Um, and then within the unpaid care work sort of realm of things, you know, Jeanette mentioned sort of the limitations um, on the data that we have, a lot of that being very high income country focused. Um, and unfortunately, we know um, from, from pre-COVID sort of evidence that 
the care economy uh, plays out, right, in very different ways in lower and, and middle income country contexts where household structures differ, um, where some of those social safety nets and child care assistance programs were never available to begin with. So I think we need a clearer picture of exactly um, how COVID is playing out in terms of unpaid care work burdens for those lower income uh, women and, and populations. Third point um, is where we are seeking to fill those gaps and, and hustle through mobile phone surveys and, and other means to fill them. We do still have pre-COVID evidence to rely on. Uh, I'll give two examples here. The first is within the realm of gender-based violence. Uh, so Amber Peterman, a uh, non-resident fellow at CGD, myself and several other co-authors uh, starting back in April, realized, look, it's going to take some time for us to have the exact sort of nature of um, increases or decreases or stagnations in gender-based violence rates really pinned down within, within the COVID context. So why don't we go backwards to the historical evidence um, on Zika, on Ebola, on H1N1, and not just pandemics, but other crises that play out in similar ways to trace the pathways through which uh, violence against women, and we also looked at violence against children, could be increased. So this is, you know, for example, uh, when schools close and when girls uh, may be at home and more exposed to violence within the household or pressured uh, into transactional sex, if in tandem uh, economic vulnerabilities and strains are, are there, could manifest through the lockdowns, right? And quarantines not allowing uh, a victim or a survivor to leave a particular household where violence is happening and, and seek help. Could manifest through uh, even frontline workers sort of exerting uh, power in problematic ways where they are seeking transactional sex for the vaccinations or the food aid or whatever they may have at their disposal to provide. So looking at the historical evidence, we've traced those pathways and now going forward have been able now with about 70 COVID specific studies on violence to check those against, against that historical evidence. Another area, you know, top of mind for us at, at CGD is, is the realm of economic opportunity and advancement. Uh, back in 2013, a colleague of mine, Myra Buvenich, published something called a Roadmap for Promoting Women's Economic Empowerment. And since then, we've done fairly consistent updates as the evidence base has continued to grow. So we had one out at CGD in 2016. We've just published one uh, that is West Africa specific in 2020. And so while we are hustling on the research side to understand what is needed within the COVID context, I think very important for us to be able to look back at those examples of best practice to say, look, you know, women have been resilient in the past when given uh, access to cash grants or networks or savings platforms or uh, skills training and so on and so forth. So drawing upon that evidence. The fourth and final point, uh, and this has been touched on by, by fellow panelists as well briefly, is to prioritize a couple of absolutely essential areas that have unfortunately pre-COVID been neglected. And now is the time, right? If not now, when? Um, for us to recognize sort of the essential nature of investments in addressing violence, uh, this shadow pandemic, but also uh, the statistics revealing how problematic of a widespread human rights and economic development issue this was pre-pandemic, and also looking at unpaid care work looking at the care economy and how much women and girls disproportionate unpaid care burdens hold them back uh, from economic participation, advancement, and sort of full participation in public life. So going forward, uh, myself and, and a team at CGD on the GBV front will be collaborating with folks out of a new Lancet commission focused on gender-based violence and the maltreatment of young people as I mentioned at the start, to take that evidence on what we know the problem is, to then pair it with what we know donors and policymakers are currently doing in response. We're so grateful to Jeanette and colleagues at UN Women who have put together this fantastic tracker that is country by country uh, providing us with data on, on how countries are, are providing 
uh, assistance to survivors and, and seeking to be more resilient to prevent violence going forward. We're going to seek to complement that a bit with what donor institutions are doing on that front as well. Um, and then finally, ask that all important question of what else is needed? What does the best practice, uh, sort of rigorous evidence, uh, tell us is needed to fill those gaps and make a difference? The same on the unpaid care front. So there have been uh, very exciting conversations catalyzed over the past several years, for example, with uh, the IFC's tackling child care work. Um, we ourselves last year at an annual conference on, on women and gender that we run brought together early childhood development uh, researchers, practitioners, donors, policymakers, and those who focus on women's economic empowerment, seeking to get those two groups of folks to speak to each other um, a bit more and, and seek uh, to develop sort of not just a research but an investment agenda going forward. Um, in the COVID context, we're going to be seeking to review what donor institutions and what governments are doing uh, to provide additional child care assistance support to narrow some of those gaps in unpaid care work burdens. And a very quick review that is by no means finalized at this stage reveals that this issue is getting quite a lot of media attention. It's getting quite a lot of recognition in high level speeches and, and the rhetoric is there. Um, but the brass tacks on the actual sort of quantity of investment being prioritized into this area, frankly, pales in comparison to issues that I think we could argue it should be just as uh, prioritized against, whether you're thinking about infrastructure development or access to finance or skills training, right, these other critical areas of economic development. Um, so stay tuned as we continue to sort of get the full inventory of current investments in that area, um, especially from the donor institutions, you know, the World Bank, uh, the other multilaterals and development finance institutions that we focus on, and hope to make the case that, as I said, GBV and unpaid care really need, you know, if not now when, increased investment um, in the COVID context and in the longer term. Thank you so much, Megan. I have been an awful chair. I haven't kept everyone to time because it's all been so interesting. I wanted to keep listening. Um, but we've got a few questions or a number of questions that have come in now. Um, and so I'm going to pose three to you and open up the floor to uh, you all to respond to whichever ones you want. And then we'll see if we have time for further questions after that. So the first question is, um, in the current crisis, it appears that women in their 20s and 30s are at higher risk of suicide compared to their counterparts. What kind of ad hoc measures could be advised on a global or national level to tackle the mental health specific problems arising in gender disparity? The second question I'm posing is, have any global health organizations and national leaders shown an interest in changing the status quo on these equalities? And how is this data gathered? Do you have any concrete examples? And the final question I'm going to pose to you now is around, would you say that risk behavior impacts on how men have responded to the risk of catching COVID? For example, how men might be wearing uh, masks less than women or adhering to isolation restrictions compared to women. So I am going to uh, start with um, Sarah. She's in my top left corner unless you want me to start elsewhere? Uh, I'm very happy to start. And I'll, I'll start with the one that I probably feel more qualified to answer, which is around risk behaviours in men. Um, and I think the, the very quick and easy answer to that is we simply don't have enough data to, to say. Um, I think that there's a lot of sort of anecdotal reporting, but at a global level, we certainly don't have um, enough hard evidence to say that this is about differences in risk behaviours. Um, so I, I'm not sure I could uh, give a more fulsome answer than, than that, except to say I would also, given my background and training and everything I believe in, um, caution against putting risk at the level of individuals um, that, you know, what drives health outcomes uh, beyond the individual is the, 
gendered structures within which people operate. So whilst um, it, it, you, know, you, you can measure risk behaviors at individual levels, you have to really think about what drives people to act in the way they do. Fabulous, thank you. I'm going to pass to Jeanette. Thank you, Claire. I think I'll tackle the question about uh, what uh, policy actions countries are taking um, to, to change some of the things that we talked about today in, in all of our presentations. Um, and there are a number of uh, concrete examples. I will say that uh, Megan was alluding to some of the work that we've been doing tracking policies and whether the responses uh, to the pandemic are gender sensitive. And by and large, they're not. Uh, there are a number of countries that are making uh, sure that uh, the policies they're implementing um, have a gender focus. Uh, but I would say, just looking at some of the numbers that, that uh, we have, and this is early data, right? Uh, so we'll have to see you know, how it also changes over time as, as policies and, and interventions are, are reduced and, and taken back and, and, you know, um, and the situation changes. But um, just looking at how many countries have uh, taken a gender perspective in um, policies and interventions aimed at addressing labor market issues and unpaid care and domestic work, only 17% uh, of countries have, have measures in place to, to tackle these issues and to really squarely address uh, that care crisis that many of us talked about today. Uh, so that just gives you an example of, of some of the things that, that uh, we're struggling with. You know, the rhetoric is there, as, as Megan uh, alluded to, but oftentimes the, the follow-up, right, the follow-through is not there. Not only is it not there in terms of the, the policies and interventions that are being prioritized, but in terms of the resources, right, that you need to fully implement them. So, so that's another area, not just whether they are committing to it and, and saying that they're going to have a policy in place, but whether that then those policies are, are um, adequately financed and, and funded. Uh, so that's another area that, that we're uh, monitoring closely. In terms of um, countries that, that are doing some concrete things, um, you know, just looking at uh, some of the things that, that uh, we've seen, um, El Salvador, for example, has mandated private uh, companies to provide 30 days of paid sick leave uh, to all uh, workers age 60 and over, pregnant women and those with pre-existing conditions. So trying to address in some ways some of the gaps that we talked about in terms of family leave, paid sick leave, et cetera. Uh, Burkina Faso is providing cash transfers to informal workers, uh, including you know, um, kind of street vendors and the likes are really addressing that problem that we talked about of, um, of informal workers um, being much more at risk in, in this climate of job losses and not having any access to social protection and how to address that and make sure that um, you know, they have income security during this time of crisis. Uh, countries such as Germany, Italy, and Costa Rica have introduced uh, paid reductions in working time, working share arrangements. They've expanded access to family leave and paid sick leave um, and are including self-employed workers um, uh, and childcare uh, for essential workers as part of their package. Um, so again, some concrete examples of, of things that can make a difference and some of the, the recommendations we're making are exactly that. It's not only you know, what can governments do, but also what can the private sector do to, to address some of these issues. Uh, in Argentina, income support measures such as the universal child allowance um, and emergency family income uh, cover all domestic workers. Um, I have a longer presentation that goes into um, some of the issues around domestic workers. We didn't have time, I went over already. But just to say that this is another really critical area. Um, uh, oftentimes these are migrant women, these are women from, from marginalized and excluded groups doing this kind of work and, and really vulnerable in this time of crisis. And so making sure that they're being reached with these policy interventions. Um, and then finally, you know, we, we, we talked about, I think there were a couple of questions on the chat about um, the difference that women leaders can make in, in, in making sure that the policy responses are, are, are gender sensitive. And, and so, you know, the reality is, and I think maybe some of my other um, panelists can speak more about it, is that we have too few women um, in, in these roles, right? So um, only 6.7% of, of head of states are women. Um, you know, you, you, you look at the health sector and yes, you know, 70, 80, 90% of those on the front line, as, as Rupa mentioned, are, are women. But when you look at those who are executives in, in, in the health sector, who are ministers of health, um, 
who are really relegated to a quarter of those positions of leadership. Um, so when you look at the number of women that the share of women that are ministers of health, I think it's a, in terms of the last data, only 24.7% are, are women. And so there's a real gap uh, and, and a real struggle there. Uh, but where we do see women, um, you know, in positions of, of power and leadership, um, you know, uh, some of the stuff that I think Rupa also highlighted, we are seeing, um, you know, some of the emerging data quite limited, and I think the sample is too small, but we are seeing that they're making a difference, right? New Zealand is an example uh, that gets highlighted a lot in terms of um, being able to respond to the pandemic and to the crisis um, early and decisively prioritizing the health effects over the economic. That's something that uh, some work, I think it's from the, the Reading and Liverpool uh, University have, have looked at, you know, are, how are women leaders different from male leaders with this small sample of only, you know, 21 or so um, heads of state, we are seeing that they're prioritizing um, and, and, and taking action that, that focuses on the immediate health impact and then realizing that, that you have to play kind of that long game, right? That they, you will need to address uh, the economic effects as well, but we also need to take control of, of, the, of the health impact. And, and, um, and so there's some concrete examples. I think the last one I was going to say, I think New Zealand just recently has instituted a law making sure that we have, um, that women who are, um, um, you know, who have experienced domestic violence have 10 days of, of paid, uh, leave to to be able to move house and to do you know to to address kind of the the immediate you know need uh, for themselves and their families and so again concrete examples of women leaders prioritizing women's needs and so I think um, while the evidence is is still needs to be kind of expanded I think there is some some signaling there about the impact that women can make um, when they are you know at the decision table and and prioritizing uh, you know again the the, the needs and and um, um, challenges that women are, um, at all levels are facing. Over to you. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, Megan. Yes, I will just quickly build on Jeanette's last point. Um, I think to keep in mind two things as we are continuing to collect information on governments and donors' policy responses to these issues. The first is, you know, when we say gender sensitive, that doesn't necessitate an intersectional lens, even though it should, right? So when we ask questions around gender sensitivity, I think it's very important to take it that next step farther and say, which women, right? So especially in lower income settings, if you're in the informal or non-salaried workforce, um, there's a risk that a lot of these benefits that are being rolled out that only apply to uh, higher income, right, formal workers, are not actually applicable to you. So asking sort of questions about the intersectional um, inclusion of these measures, I think will be, will be key. The second of course is follow through, um, which I think has been a big theme of our discussion. A lot of these responses being rolled out right now are still very early days. They're still in a commitment making phase. So a particular government has pledged to take a gender sensitive approach to their social protection efforts or their uh, economic recovery plans, we are going to have to hold them accountable with the data that we've all been discussing. So has there been follow through on the implementation of some of these commitments that are still quite, quite new? And last but not least, Rupa. <clears throat> Great, such a, just a building on what's already been said. Um, I do wanna to touch upon the mental health one. I think that is a really crucial one and this is a society-wide issue. We need to take the stigma out of mental health but also really acknowledge that health and social care workers are people first and they are um, you know, taking on um, some very tough jobs at risk uh, and a lot of risks that I talked about already that you know puts the pressure and stress um, at a higher level and they're more you know, at, at risk for developing a mental health um, needs and that we don't really set up our health systems to take care of our health workers. And there you know, really is a strong call to action uh, from the WHO, which was launched around uh, Patient Safety Day, really making it both about patient safety, but also about health worker safety and especially the mental psychosocial needs. So really designing policies um, and providing services where one, uh, mental health is not stigmatized and two, that there are support um, services available from counseling um, to also really just providing the, uh, the share of um, 
burden that health workers already are facing. So providing services for family care, child care, um, and flexibility in work, um, and also making sure they are getting safe and decent work conditions. There are ILO, International Labor Organization, uh, conventions on this, including um, ILO Convention on 189 on informal work and 190 on workplaces free from all forms of harassment and violence. Uh, the 190 still needs to be um, ratified further. Only three countries um, have agreed to it. So this is an opportunity to use global agreements and tools to impact um, you know, uh, realities. Then as far as the question raised about, are we seeing you know, more commitment from global organizations or other governments around the world to take on gender equality? Uh, you know, this answer uh, is a, you know, two parts. One, we are seeing uh, you know, increased commitment, but is it enough? No, I'd say that we need much more commitment and larger commitment and link to actually funding and financing the commitments that are being made. Uh, Women in Global Health had a security summit in September where we launched our um, uh, commitments part of our COVID 5050 campaign. And we were able to get 40 commitments from seven governments and many global health organizations, all um, committing to gender responsive health security. But we know that, you know, that commitment needs to turn into real action and investments linked to that action. And we'd like to see a lot more of that. WHO particularly um, has um, committed to creating a gender COVID-19 um, working group, which we are still waiting to see uh, turn into an actionable reality. So we're hoping any, any moment now that it is something that engages civil society and academics and experts alike. Um, we know that they are working closely with partners on this call on gender and sex disaggregated data. Uh, but again, you know, more needs to be done. And um, really the call is for all of us to pressure our governments to prioritize this and um, use our governments to really make sure that you were contextualizing it in um, on the ground realities. Uh, thank you, back to you, Claire. Thank you, everybody. We're already out of time, if you can believe it. Um, thank you for all of your time this afternoon, this morning, wherever you are. And thank you to all the audience for joining us uh, on this panel session. It's been such a treat to have such excellent minds all together and sharing all their thinking on um, sex and gender and COVID. Um, so from all of us at LSE, we wish you well. We hope to see you, hear you uh, again. And if you want to learn more about the coming events uh, at LSE, please do check out the LSE webpage uh, and uh, please follow us on Twitter. And we will see you all soon. Have a lovely evening.